westward expansion of the United States and development of new and larger cities created a tremendous demand for lumber in the mid and late 1800s. While farmers were busy busting sod in the prairies of the Great Plains, lumberjacks were busy cutting trees to satisfy those pioneers' hunger for lumber. The pine forest of eastern Jackson County was among the first large stands of pine that Wisconsin contributed to this westward expansion. The area had abundant white and red pine trees, which grew tall and had light, strong wood. The trees were relatively easy to cut, haul, and saw into lumber. The lumber produced in the area was ideal for constructing homes, farm buildings, stores, and bridges. The lumber barons felt that once the forests were harvested, the cleared land would be turned into productive farms, so they were doing their part in taming the wild land. The first major transportation link between Jackson County and the developing world was the Black River. The water that provided power for the sawmills also brought them the raw material, logs, and the means to transport the finished product, lumber, to market. The northern part of eastern Jackson County was where the river lumbermen concentrated their efforts. Because the east fork of the Black River meandered through this area, making it relatively easy to transport the pine logs. In this area, oxen and horses were used to drag the logs to the nearest stream or to log landings, where they were loaded on sleighs for the longer hauls to the east fork of the Black River. The southeastern section of Jackson County was a different story. It took extra ingenuity to harvest its pine. The area was made up of numerous swamps that encircled sandy islands, which were covered with dense stands of mature pine. This vast pine forest of over 300 million board feet of timber lay between Saddle Mound, Mather, and Milston. The swamps, which were a remnant of Wisconsin's largest internal lake, Lake Wisconsin, made this pine forest seem inaccessible and beyond the river lumberman's exploitation. Part of this area was referred to as the Big Swamp or the Grand Marsh by old timers. Sphagnum moss, swamp grasses, and stands of tamarack filled the old lake bed, making its abundant water useless to river lumbermen. The dilemma confounding them was how to economically harvest the area's abundant timber. As early as the 1870s, the forest in the Big Swamp was being whittled away at by numerous small-time operations. One of the first of these was the Stoddard Sawmill. The owner of this mill, R.M. Stoddard, had built a dam across Morrison Creek and used the flowage it created to operate his water-powered sawmill. The lumber this mill produced was hauled out by wagon. That wagon road is still visible north and south of the mill site. In the 1870s, there was another small-time operation with a steam-powered portable sawmill near this town of Mather Station. Darius Goodyear and his son Charles had just purchased the mill and some of the land holdings of John Mather. They owned land in Juneau, Monroe, and Jackson counties. It would be the Goodyears who would be credited with solving the dilemma created by the Big Swamp. In 1881, after logging off their property near Mather Station, the Goodyears moved three and a half miles northwest to the edge of the Big Swamp. There they constructed their first permanent sawmill at Chaplin. The mill was located in a flat swampy area, making it possible for the Goodyears to use three methods of log transportation, one common, one rare, and one unique. The common method was the use of horses and sleighs. Sleighs worked well in the winter months if the weather cooperated by being cold enough to freeze the swamps and wet enough to have a good blanket of snow. The rare method used by the Goodyears was tramways. These tramways were like railroad tracks, only they used small logs about eight inches in diameter for the rails. These logs were laid fairly parallel to each other 
about five feet apart and could be laid out into the woods wherever their trees were being cut. The wagon's concave wheels could slide in or out or float on its axles to compensate for the less than perfectly parallel logs. The wagons were loaded with logs and pulled to the mill by horse or oxen. Notice the concave wheels under this wagon. While those two methods worked well for the timber that was close to the mill and on high ground, much of the Goodyear's timber was located some five to ten miles in a northerly direction across the big swamp. How the Goodyears solved the problem of getting their logs across the swamp was probably unique to Wisconsin in that they used a network of canals. Twenty miles or more of these three or four foot wide canals were hand dug through the sphagnum and tamarack swamps. Four small low profile dams on the canals still existed in 1993. These were apparently developed to keep water levels deep enough to float the logs through the canals. The dams were made with a wooden water level control structure and were approximately six feet wide and flanked by low earthen dikes. While the pine on some smaller islands like Drescher and Bear Bluff would have been easily harvested and skidded to the canals, the main upland stands of pine would have required very long skids just to get to the canal system. Once the logs were skidded to the canal, it would have taken a slow, labor-intensive pull to the sawmill. The canal's northern end was over eight miles from the sawmill, which could have required about a four-hour pull. As ingenious as the canals were, they were too slow and restricted. The dilemma remained. How could the big swamp pine be harvested in an economical way? In 1883, the newly formed Wisconsin Valley Division of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railway Company agreed to make a three and one half mile spur from Mather Station into the sawmill at Chaplin. That same year, the Goodyears moved their main office to Toma and constructed a planing mill there. Constructing the planing mill in Toma made their operation very dependent upon the Wisconsin Valley Division. Rough sawing the lumber at Chaplin and shipping it daily to the new drying yards in Toma meant any future mills they built could be developed without a drying yard. Considering the numerous mill and forest fires that could engulf a drying yard, that proved to be a wise decision. The sawmill at Chaplin was set on fire by lightning in 1885 and burned down. Here we see the second mill at Chaplin. The barrels on the roof are for fire protection. Stairs on the left side of the roof and boards nailed on the right side made it easy for workers to get to the top of the roof to dip their buckets into the barrels filled with water. Roof fires were a real problem since many sawmills of the day were constructed almost wholly of wood. Some sawmill owners purchased funnel-shaped buckets that would not sit upright, so they couldn't be used for other purposes and disappear before they were needed to put out a fire. By 1885, the Goodyears had figured out that a network of logging railroad lines could solve the dilemma created by the big swamp. An article in the Black River Falls newspaper, Badger State Banner, November 20, 1885, stated, C.A. Goodyear informed us the other day that he would probably build his railroad from Mather so as to connect with the Omaha Road at Black River Falls, as it will give him a chance to secure better rates in shipping lumber. He could then ship on either the Omaha or St. Paul. One and a half years later, in 1887, the Wisconsin Valley Division Railroad began developing a spur north of Chaplin into Goodyear's timber. This railroad crossed the big swamp by using the sand from each island to develop the grade across to the next island. In the first few months of construction, it developed 10 miles of line and ended at Alva Station. Most of this first grade was over swampland and according to Charles Lapham, the Wisconsin Valley Division surveyor, 
this part of the line was completed late in the fall, and certain portions of it, principally in the marshes, required complete renewal early the following spring. During the winter, the Goodyears determined on a new location for their mill at a point about three miles from Elva and practically at right angles to the direction of the line that had been built the previous fall. In the spring of 1888, the Wisconsin Valley Division resumed their work heading for the new site chosen by the Goodyears. This site was wisely located near the center of their timber holdings on a section of Morrison Creek that could be dammed for a mill pond. Other sawmills were developing deals to use the new railroad, as explained in the words of Charles Lapham. I was detailed to locate a line from Elva to the new mill site, but before the line was fully cleared, further instructions were received to locate a track to a mill to be built by a man by the name of Withy. When the above-mentioned lines were well underway, instructions were given to locate and build a branch line from some convenient point on the Goodyear line to a mill about to be built by Satchett's Brilliance and Company. The station at the mill site was called McKenna for the superintendent of the Wisconsin Valley Division at the time. The name Lampham Junction was given to the place where the Goodyear and McKenna line diverged. This line also continued past McKenna to another sawmill that was well under construction at Zeta. By the end of 1888, the Wisconsin Valley Division had constructed more than 19 miles of line connecting Chaplin, Bear Bluff Station, Spurbeck, Alva Station, Withy, Goodyear, McKenna, and Zeta to its main line at Mather Station. Once the towns were established, passenger train service was begun on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. According to the schedule, it took the train a little over six hours to complete the run. From looking at the schedule, it seems the fastest the train went was 11 miles per hour. Shortly after rails were laid to the new mill site, Goodyear's built their second town there and called it Goodyear. While the sawmill was constructed on the south side of Morrison Creek, the main part of town was built on the north side, directly across the pond from the mill. In August of 1891, the Goodyears lost this sawmill to a fire, but were back in operation four months later. Here we see the south side of the mill, and again we can pick out the same tall man dressed in a suit in the left center of the men and is probably Charles A. Goodyear. From a similar vantage point, we have another photograph that shows the whole mill and part of the town across the mill pond. On the right center, we see the Goodyear's two-spot locomotive, which was pulling at least 18 logging flat cars. Loaded flat cars like this one extend back along the mill, around the west end of the mill pond, and in front of the workers' homes. The two-spot was sitting close to the end of the Wisconsin Valley Division line and the beginning of the Goodyear, Nielsville, and Northern Railroad. This close-up of the Goodyear Railroad shows where it crossed the Mill Pond Dam over Morrison Creek. Note the building above the head of the man standing by the dog. Its large doors and the soot mark over the doors indicate its Goodyear's engine house. While this photograph looks like it was taken from a hot air balloon, that's just the result of the camera's wide angle lens. It was actually taken from the roof of this building. Looking over the mill pond, we see some of the homes in the town of Goodyear. They all seem of similar construction and therefore were probably company homes built for their workers who had families. According to the trade magazine, Northwestern Lumberman, of January 1890, Goodyear had its own post office, boarding house, school, and community hall. This is the best photograph of part of the town of Goodyear. In handwriting on the bottom of the original photograph was written, M. Kelly Photographer. 
Camp Crew at Goodyear, Wisconsin. It may have been a crew that was getting organized to head into the woods. At first, it may look like a photo of a lumberjack camp, but there are a few things that show it's a home in town. The buildings have many large windows, which were not used in camp buildings, and the second and third windows from the right have curtains, obviously a woman's touch, which would be out of place in most lumberjack camps. In this final photograph of Goodyear's mill, we are given a rare glimpse of the loading dock. It looks like there was room for about eight or ten flat cars on the two sets of tracks next to the loading ramp. On the far right, we see the silo-like refuse burner and its conveyor system. Today, Merlin Lambert Park is located at the site of the town of Goodyear. If you visit there now, you'll see a road crossing Potter's Flowage. Goodyear's Dam would have been located a few yards west of the bridge. The mill pond would have been to the east of the bridge and at about the same height as the present flowage. With their new town and sawmill as a hub, the Goodyears developed their own standard gauge railroad. With over 77 miles of railroad grades reaching out from Goodyear, their railroad resembled the tentacles of a resting octopus. They called their railroad the Goodyear, Nielsville, and Northern Railway Company. While Goodyear's main lines were fairly well built, most spurs were developed to a bare minimum, since they were used for only a few months while the timber was cut and hauled out. How were the grades made? Immigrant workers were a readily available and inexpensive labor source. In this area, especially Swedes and Norwegians were used. While they were the main source of labor, steam-powered derricks were also in use by many railroad construction companies and could have been used for the more difficult construction jobs. Derricks were used to excavate fill and load it on flat cars and to move ties and rails onto the developed grade. We get a glimpse of how the Goodyear lumberjacks lived and worked from two photos of the same crew. Of the 31 men in this photo, there are at least two with a good sense of humor. Notice the two just to the right of center, who have decided to ham it up and pretend they are getting married. The supposed bride is wearing a long veil, which is probably a tablecloth, while the groom is carrying a suitcase. Not too many of the others seem humored by the charade. The buildings look very well built for a lumberjack camp and even have shingled roofs. In this photo, the same group of men had moved into the woods and were posing at a landing near the Goodyear railroad tracks. Here we see four men working with their own team of horses, seven men working with cant hooks, and one with an ax. Notice the fine stand of white pine behind the men. Another enterprise the Goodyears were involved in was a sandstone quarry begun in 1889. This quarry was located on the top of the western end of Saddle Mound. They ran a double track narrow gauge tramway up to where the stone was quarried. On the tramway cars, large sandstone blocks were lowered to the railroad spur pictured here. As a loaded tramway car on top was lowered, it pulled up an empty car. So the sandstone blocks and gravity supplied the tramway's power. A building made of saddle mound sandstone is still in use at Toma. The whitewashed building is dated 1890 and has a large letter G near its top. It was the Goodyear's main office at the turn of the century and may be the only building that remains of the Goodyear's lumbering business. In 1892, the Goodyears extended a logging railroad toward Milston when Charles Goodyear purchased timber east of Milston and another tract in the township of Brockway. The Badger State Banner of Black River Falls wrote this about the deal. C.A. Goodyear, the Monroe County candidate for the Republican nomination for Congress, was in the city yesterday to close a big pine timber deal.
He purchased a tract of pine land in the eastern part of the town Brockway, estimated to contain six million feet of standing timber from P.S. Davidson for a consideration amounting to $22,500. We met Mr. Goodyear while he was here and found him to be a very pleasant gentleman. He is also business through and through. This new line developed toward Milston enabled the Goodyear Mill to operate for another two years. While the Goodyear logging railroads cross 12 creeks, there are only two partial bridge structures that still remain. They are both on Pigeon Creek, which was one of the smallest creeks they crossed. While most of their other crossings would have required trestle work, the Pigeon Creek bridges only required large logs laid down across the creek parallel to the grade. Ties were laid down across these and then the rails on the ties. In 1990, when Pigeon Creek flowage was drained to allow for dike repair, these bridges were exposed. The bridges are right next to each other. The left one is on the main line, and the right bridge is on a dead-end spur that headed toward Milston. The second largest sawmill operation opened up by the Wisconsin Valley Division Railroad was at McKenna. In a matter of a few months, in the fall of 1888, a town of about 400 people exploded into existence. The sawmill and adjoining town were owned by the partnership of William McMillan, Al Williams, and Hamilton Salsich. One difference between the Goodyear and McKenna operation was the type of railroad each developed. While the Goodyears chose the larger standard gauge equipment and developed 77 miles of lines, the McKenna sawmill operation developed 61 miles of narrow gauge logging lines. This is the best photo of one of McKenna's locomotives and was taken at one of their lumberjack camps. The photographer, Charles Van Schoik, has his camera set for a delayed shot and is in the photograph, lower left corner, third man in, wearing a derby. Apparently he was timing the photo because he had just checked his pocket watch in his right hand. This is a clearer shot of a similar narrow gauge locomotive. This is another photo of a McKenna lumberjack camp. Note both men are wearing different kinds of rubber boots and there is a hand dug well behind the man on the left. Plus there are two pigs to the right of the men just above the railroad tracks. A third photo of a McKenna camp shows three men on the right in the foreground sitting on a three-wheeled railroad inspection car. It was hand-operated and explains how the photographer traveled the eight miles from the town of McKenna to this camp. Many of the same men from this camp photo are in this woods photo. This is what they called a landing, a place where the logs were dragged by horses or oxen right next to the railroad line so they could be loaded on flat cars and hauled to the mill pond at the sawmill. In one section of McKenna's Railroad, they developed the most concentrated logging lines in Jackson County and possibly in all of Wisconsin. There are almost 10 miles of logging grades in one square mile. In this area, there is a railroad grade about every 200 yards. The area is flat and was full of large trees conditions which must have made it both easy and worthwhile to construct the many grades. A possible clue to the reason for so many lines is that the McKenna mill was able to saw logs that were up to 60 feet long for construction jobs like bridges. Compared to the standard 16-foot logs, 60-foot logs would warrant the shorter skidding distance for the sake of the oxen or horses. Once the trees were cut, the logs were loaded on flat cars and brought to this mill pond. Where is the mill pond? Under all the logs. The dark narrow band across the center of the photo is the trestle bridge for the McKenna Logging Railroad. Just moving onto the bridge from the right is a locomotive pulling at least seven flat cars of logs. In this photograph, we see the mill pond bank opposite the sawmill. Notice the ramp created by a layer of tightly laying diagonal logs. 
there was a set of tilted railroad tracks just above that log ramp. Loaded flat cars were switched onto those tracks, the retaining chains were released, and the logs would roll down the ramp into the mill pond. Here we see what it looked like between the unloading ramp and the sawmill. In the center of this photograph, we see the McKenna locomotive shed. It's where they housed and repaired their two locomotives. The Wisconsin Valley Division Depot is the small building on the right center. 100 years ago, the view back across the mill pond from the locomotive shed would have looked like this. The mill steam power plant was located in the larger white brick building against the mill. Note its tall chimney topped with a spark cap to prevent the much dreaded forest fire. To the right of the sawmill is a conveyor ramp for moving waste wood into the refuse burner, which looks like a farm silo and is also topped with a spark cap. Between the refuse burner and the mill pond was a white brick building that housed a pump to force hot water through a network of pipes on the bottom of the mill pond, which kept it from freezing over in the winter. The planing mill is to the right of this photograph and is also shown on the right center of this photo. The planing mill also had its own steam power plant as is evident from the high smokestack that barely clears the trees. The town of McKenna was located across the creek from the mill. Photos indicate it only had one major street running through town. This photo shows the street was mainly lined with homes. According to the Jackson County Journal, August 17, 1892, 136 Stump Avenue was the scene of a drunk impersonating a monkey. So we note the buildings were even numbered on its main street. The hotel appears to have been at the end of Stump Avenue towards Zeta. Here we see a couple of two-story buildings, which are almost twins. They were probably both part of the company-owned hotel. In the photo, it's easy to pick out whole families all dressed up in their fineries. The group includes one baby, nine girls, three boys, two women, 32 men, and one dog. There was no saloon in town. All the sawmill owners in the area were against easy access to alcohol, as the lumber industry was extremely dangerous even when the workers were sober. Baumel's saloon was the closest, being one half mile west of McKenna and eight miles south of Goodyear. This photo was entitled Andrew Baumel, but doesn't explain which man he is. He is probably the man on the far right. He set up Baumel's saloon in his wife's name. Here's what the George Warren Company wrote the Goodyears on December 10th, 1889. Gentlemen, only by refusal of the town clerk to issue until every technical requirement fulfilled did the issuance of a liquor license fail this day of being made to Mrs. A. Baumel and Mrs. Upton. Meanwhile, we make rigorous protest against this accomplishment. Can and will you make good your promise last spring that T.P. Withy would not grant one? Please do so promptly, all you can, and in the interest of all that is good. Since the man on the porch was wearing an apron, it seems likely that this McKenna business is a cafe. We also get a good idea of how people in this area dressed in the 1890s. The buggy on the street is the photographer's. It's his transportation and mobile darkroom. The two blurs in the foreground are pigs on the move. Pigs must have been popular in McKenna, as this next photo shows at least 12 pigs and five piglets. The photographer, Charles Van Schoik, has gotten in the shot again and is holding a slop bucket in his right hand. Note the timber, or lack of it, in the back of the photo. They didn't waste any time cutting dead trees. Just down Stump Avenue, we see buildings that appear to be stores, company offices, and the more elaborate homes of company men. Near the end of this street, a very interesting photograph was taken of three couples in a boat, apparently on a Sunday outing. The lady in the back of the boat with a striped outfit is holding a banjo or some sort of stringed instrument. 
The photographer may have turned around and took this picture of the mill across the mill pond. Remember that one source said that they could saw 60-foot logs. Notice the section of the wall at the top of the gangway that is tilted up and out for rolling in long logs. Were they sawing some extra long logs the day this photo was taken? It appears there is one going up the gangway. Here are a couple of photos of the mill crew outside the west side of the McKenna Mill. In the first, there are 41 men who were probably on their lunch break. In the second, there are about 103 men and one girl. My guess is that the man with the girl is one of the owners, Al Williams. Above the girl and next to the mill, this photo was taken. It shows 21 non-smiling men who were proud of their Class A shingles. W.S. Kibbe, whose name is on the back of the photo, is in the third row, far right. On the photo, he had penciled me on his shirt. Kibbe was related to three families in the area, Nemitz, Bundy, and Gebhardt. A close-up of the second man from the right, on the bottom row, shows he was holding a shingle packing end, with the company name Williams and Salsich stenciled on it. Our view of the mill is expanded by this photo. It was taken from a hill and shows the large piles of lumber in their drying yard. After the rough sawn lumber was sufficiently air dried, it was loaded on lumber buggies like this one and hauled to this planing mill. Here we see the proud crew of the planing mill out on the boardwalk. Some of the men are wearing leather aprons or pants to help with the sticky problem of pitch. The vertical pole on the right is a telephone pole. The phone hookup indicates that there was some sort of office in the planing building, possibly where shipping orders were received. Behind the building on the left is the Wisconsin Valley Division railroad boxcar being loaded with lumber. George Warren and James Gamble operated the sawmill at Warren Mills, today known as Warren's, from 1868 to 1874. In 1874, that partnership was changed to Frank G. Warren, son of George, and William A. Barber but retained the name George Warren and Company. By the late 1880s, having harvested trees around Warren Mills for 20 years, the owners decided to construct a satellite sawmill closer to their remaining timber holdings. Transportation distances were more critical to the Warren Company because they used wagons for transporting their logs to the mill in the warm months and sleighs during the winter. Their new mill, Zeta, was constructed nine miles due north of their old mill and was under construction before the Wisconsin Valley Division Railroad began to build its spur to the proposed site of the Goodyear Sawmill on Morrison Creek. Of the area's three main sawmills, the Zeta operation was the least dependent on the railroad since it could have shipped all its rough sawn lumber to Warren Mills by wagon. Here we see about six wagons of lumber heading for their main sawmill. While the Goodyear and McKenna mills used railroads to bring their logs to the mill, Zeta was mainly supplied with logs hauled on horse-pulled sleighs. This limited them at first to winter hauling because the area between their mill and their timber was too swampy to use wagons. These sleighs are ready to be unloaded into the mill pond. The Zeta mill also used tramways and starting in 1892, the Goodyear's logging trains supplied them with logs. Here we see a lengthwise photo of the Zeta mill pond. There are two log unloading ramps on the right side of the pond. Notice the upright boards coming out of the water in the extreme left center of this photo. The same boards are in front of the horses. In this photograph, and were a part of a system to keep part of the pond from freezing over. This photo was taken of the same unloading area from across the pond. 
two sleighs are being unloaded and on the far side of the load closest to the mill is a large log of at least three feet in diameter. Its end is visible between the two men working to unload the sleigh. In the center of this photo we see a catwalk out into the mill pond and on the right side the refuse removal system. In front of the mill alongside the gangway which pulled the logs into the mill was a small building they jokingly called the hotel. This was where the man responsible to push logs onto the gangway could get out of the weather. The man in the middle may be George Warren. Note the box on the sleigh runners in the center of the photo. It's a large watertight box that was used to sprinkle water on the logging roads at night to make an ice road for the log sleighs. Here we see it from a different angle. We also notice an upright cylinder with steam rising off it, indicating it was the apparatus used to condense the steam from the boiler for heating the pond. The heated water was forced through feeder lines laid out from the cylinder on the bottom of the pond. In our next photo, we see the entire mill and the railroad loading dock, with a flat car being loaded with lumber. Here the photographer was standing on Zeta's Dam over McKenna Creek, which connected the sawmill with the town. We get a good view of the refuse conveyor. What is the small roofed structure over the middle of the conveyor system? It could be where one conveyor belt or chain ended, allowing smaller refuse like sawdust to fall into suspended bins for dumping into wagons, as in this photo. As was true of all the main sawmills in this area, Zeta used a conveyor chain or gangway to move the logs to the second story of the mill where the main saw blades were located. On the second floor, the logs were run through the main saws. The head sawyer determined the best cuts to get the most boards from the logs. From here, the boards were cut to standard lengths and shipped to worn mills for drying and planing. Here we see the mill crew out on the pond's dam. The mill pond control structure appears just behind the front row of men. The man with suspenders front left is standing by the planks used to regulate the mill pond's water depth. The pole in his right hand with a hook on the end was used to pull the planks when lowering the water. This is another photo of the same group of men and boys by the mill. In this photo taken in 1893, six of the 30 men are wearing baseball caps. Newspaper reports of the day do mention baseball games being played by some of the lumbering town's teams. We have a couple of good photos of the town as it was being built in 1887. The two-story building in the center under construction is the store. The building just to the left of the store is the boarding house. A photo from the opposite angle gives us a good view of the boarding house and the store in the right background. Inside the boarding house, we see the dining area. Strangely, none of the coffee cups seem to have handles. Twenty-three men who worked for George Warren and Company at their Zeta mill are shown in this photo. According to Warren Company letters, Ole Olson, the tallest man in the top row, had charge of the matters at Zeta. The small mallet he was holding probably showed he was also the local man in charge of the modern woodman of America, which was a very early version of lumberjack health insurance. All the lumber towns on the Goodyear Spur were ghost towns by late in 1895. The Goodyear Mill was dismantled and moved to Toma. The McKenna Mill was dismantled and shipped over the railroad to Star Lake in Vilas County, Wisconsin. The mill at Zeta was dismantled and returned to Warren Mills in Monroe County. The Goodyears had logged off over 25,000 acres of Jackson County Forest. The George Warren Lumber Company had logged off over 15,000 acres, and the McKenna Mill had harvested pine from over 8,000 acres. Just those three sawmills had harvested pine on over 48,000 acres, more than 75 square miles in seven years. The publication, A History of Lumbering on the Black River, 
made the following observation. By 1904, West Central Wisconsin was calculated to have contributed 37 billion feet of lumber to the housing of the nation and added $370 million to the wealth of the state. This video is like the proverbial tip of the iceberg. The rest of the story can be considered at your own pace by reading the book Logging Dilemma in the Big Swamp.